it's Michael Watts here, and I'm in Cape Town, South Africa, at the workshop of Cassimi Guitars. That is uh, Matthew Rice and Matthias Rue. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, guys. The first time in Africa. It is. Yeah. Yes, very exciting. Yeah. Um, we have had uh, a very full-on schedule in the past two days uh, since I arrived, uh, including a, a concert right here in the workshop with another one the day after tomorrow, isn't it? With, yes, that's uh, right. With Derek Gripper. Hello, Derek. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, also a, a guitar workshop today for Luthier's and players alike. In this episode of Luthier's Stories, we're going to be looking at the evolution of uh, the Cassimi instrument, and we have a very special guitar here. This is the original prototype. Guys, tell us more about this. Well, this was originally designed and built as my personal guitar as a working musician. Right. Um, it was completed back in 2008 on a guitar building course which Matthias and Colin Rock were running out of the Main Guard Guitars workshop where they were working. Right. And um, at the time, I didn't have a guitar, even though, well, there's a long story about that, borrowing my drummer's mother's guitar and <laughs> the band splitting up and it was terrible. But it, <laughs> yeah, so it sounds fairly traumatic. Anyway, my best friend over here rescued me <laughs> and said, come and build a guitar with us. So, I, of course, I jumped at this and, and I brought all my drawings that I'd, you know, I'd been fantasizing for years about how my ideal acoustic guitar would be if I were to yeah, be put in a position that. where I could have it. <laughs> and suddenly I was offered the opportunity to have it. So I brought all my sketches that I'd lovingly, you know, prepared at three in the morning on various <laughs> woe-begotten nights, <laughs> lusting after my dream guitar. I brought them all to the workshop and we went through all of this and Matthias was able to basically point me in the right direction. And I said to him, what I want is, a, is the warmest sounding steel string possible to have. Right, okay, so a lot and, of this starts to make sense. With yes, that brief. So, so Matthias immediately said, okay, 12th fret to the body joint. Mm -hmm. That'll put your bridge in the middle of the sweet spot in the soundboard. It'll give you the greatest opportunity to, uh, to exploit that, um, that warmth at that position. You know, what I didn't realize at that point was what I was looking for was not so much bass because I, I really didn't understand acoustic tone as such. All I understood was that every time I played with the band, the guitar I was playing would end up sounding like a percussion instrument. It would just be <laughs> jang, 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 jang. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you, you'd lose the chords. <laughs> and you couldn't hear if you were playing an A or a C or, a, you know, it would be pointless. You could play whatever mm. you liked and you wouldn't notice. Um, so what I was really looking for was actually those, those warm, fat trebles. Mm. What I was looking for was the, the mid-range to come through and, and really bring those chords to life, even when there's you know, other, other sounds going on around them. Um, and so that, that was the kind of starting point and the premise for building this, this instrument, which really is the prototype Cassimi guitar. It was never, I never had the idea that I was going to now design a guitar which is going to be easy to make, <laughs> and, and easy to sell to as many people as possible. That was not... This was, was your not, instrument, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, this is yeah. just going to be my dream guitar. So I, I didn't hold back in, in terms of creativity at all. In essence, this is really a main guard guitar right. in Cassini clothing. Hmm. Um, Cassini tuxedo. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much that we've changed on the inside and the way that um, the whole guitar is put together mm -hmm. and all the processes involved. Well, very different now. Well, when we first met, you were still building with an X brace and two tone bars, yes. I think, weren't you? Correct. And actually, right. Michael, we've got something very interesting to show you here. Oh, show me. <laughs> oh my God, what is that? This was, in fact... <laughs> this I can't is, look. In fact, I think this was Cassini number two, if, right. I, if I remember correctly. Now, this was um, the very first guitar that I think Michael ever played of ours, that we took over wow. to the London Acoustic Guitar. I player. didn't do that to it. <laughs> no, um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is a sort of typical example of how we were building, how we were bracing them inside. Okay. So a traditional sort of Martin X, X brace, mm -hmm. the two tone bars, heavily scalloped. For some reason, this one, this one really stood out from, in fact, every guitar that I've ever built up until, up until this one. I remember it very fondly. Um, you know, it wasn't that typical main guard sound. Mm -hmm. 
and it was I think it it, it kind of you know the, the rumblings of Cassini had already kind of got it to already it. started mm. yeah we'd been we'd been already um, kind of behind the scenes really mm-hmm. initiating the, the whole concept of Cassini guitars and, and formulating something so um, yeah what, what we actually found when we came to our new our new brace pattern the one which we currently use and I don't have an example of that but I do have the X and I have the latter yes. form. This is what this is what we start with, yeah. which is in essence just a just a, a double X made up of of, sure. of uh, much slimmer, um, thinner braces. Mm-hmm. So that would sit about there. So these two would latch onto the bridge plate, sort of cross over, jump on. So it's an X with a with a lattice, yeah, a hybrid lattice yeah. X, as as, mm-hmm. as it's known. And what we really found with that. Um, Obviously, the first few we were still learning this pattern, mm-hmm. and I think initially they were maybe a little bit tight. Right. But luckily, you know, as 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 I'm sure most luthiers will tell you, it is possible to reach inside with a little plane or a chisel mm-hmm. and relax it a bit, very mm-hmm. carefully mm-hmm. shave down some of the bracing, mm-hmm. <clears throat> just to kind of release some of that stiffness. So what um, I think what we really found the, the essential differences we were getting um, with our new pattern was that we, we found that, that with this traditional Martin Express and two turn bars, you kind of get the scoop in the mids. Mm-hmm. So it's not a very balanced instrument. And I think it's, mm-hmm. it's a sound that a lot of people are used to and a lot of people also like. Yeah. Um, and it works. It works for a lot of music. But, um, you know, somehow we just knew that we, we could do better. Yeah, just a little, I suppose, a little bit of history on, on Mangard guitars. You know, he'd, mm-hmm. he'd learned from Santa Cruz in the, what was the 70s? Right. He started up in South Africa and he just realized, you know, at that stage I think there was maybe one or two books on how to build guitars out there. I think one Probably of them was there, there slow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's an important uh, <coughs> point you just raised, actually, Matthias, because Cassimi guitars did not spring up overnight, no. did it? You had already been mm. uh, building for many years. Yes. Yeah, I built for, when I, when I officially left Mangod Guitars in, at the end of 2011, um, I'd built about... I think I'd, I'd I'd been part of building at least 250 main god guitars. Wow! So I think that was a that was a fantastic foundation and platform mm-hmm. to work off. Uh, but when I when I realised that it was time to close that door and for you know, new doors to open so that Cassini guitars mm-hmm. could be born, I think we also realised that you know um, there was this kind of searching that we need to really make this our own, mm, yeah, and absolutely. not just work off yeah. everything I'd learned. Sure thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it re- the, the real shift came actually in 2013 when a dear friend of ours, who passed away um, about two years ago now, um, we, we, uh, we ran our guitar building course. That's how we essentially managed to yeah. open our workshop doors. Right. Yeah. So, so we added, this, yeah. this, this remained a great idea. We it did. Basically <laughs> yeah. took the ball and yeah. carried on with it. And yeah, no, look, yeah. to be honest, there's, there's no real market for guitars in South Africa. So, and obviously as one does, one tries to sell one's, one's wares locally, mm, you know, mm, yeah. but that wasn't happening at the, even mm. then, you know, even though we knew the quality of our work and what we were offering and how it competed with the, you know, the Martin, you know, the, the Martins, the Taylors that mm-hmm. you'd find in the, in the local shops. So, um, so anyway, this, this, um, we, we, we uh, facilitated a, a Saturday course and right. we had about uh, six students come in mm. and then Ziggy our dear friend who passed away he came in in 2013 as part of the sort of second second batch of, of students and he just never left and he never <laughs> left we ended up actually giving him keys to the workshop yeah. he became a dear friend and he was a re- researcher of note and he was absolutely instrumental pun intended <laughs> um with regards to how we are currently building our guitars, just by the yeah. research he did mm-hmm. and the sort of questions he asked us and the sort of nudges and, right. you know, he did it in a very respectful way without, you know, it was, it was not condescending at all. It was, it was purely through love and, and wanting us to grow. Yeah, and, he had this, he had this yeah. very special gift where he could very quickly pick up on exactly what it was a person really wanted out of life. <laughs> and then he could kind of gently coax them into doing it. Because I think a lot that of people is, just just are terrified of whatever it is that they actually want, or they just don't quite know how to approach it. And Ziggy was was very unique in that way. He could kind of figure out exactly how to get a person to just 
You would just ask the right questions, mm. and then and then you just couldn't you know you just couldn't put the thought down, and eventually you, you would come up with ideas, mm. and then you, you'd end up thinking that probably they were your ideas, but <laughs> <laughs> he just planted that little seed. Exactly. Yeah. 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 He was brilliant at that. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. So um, yeah, so that's when we really started experimenting with this with this hybrid uh, lattice express mm -hmm. system, and he actually he helped us. You know, we worked on on um, developing a jig to actually cut these. Right. Because cutting these by hand is uh, it's it's an absolute nightmare to get accurate joints and, and everything. So he worked out the angles and, and we looked at it all together and um, yeah, settled on settled on a on a jig that really that we still use today that he actually personally built for us. But the whole idea is that you that you know our sort of build philosophy is that that your top you want a top that's that's stiff but light. Absolutely. So from the start, when we're selecting, you know, if, if somebody get, if I walk into a warehouse full of you know German spruce tops, and and the, the sort of wood merchant leaves me there and says, "Well, pick out your best, I don't know, hundred tops." Every one of those, um, obviously, obviously, one one takes into account the aesthetics of the timber, so mm. free of you know knots and you know resin pockets and the rest yeah, of it. Exactly. But um, most importantly, sort of after the aesthetic um, um, considerations, is actually the. You know, when you when you've when you've worked with with wood for as long as I have, you there's a real sensitivity that hmm. that is just between your fingers. Yeah. You know, you can pick up a piece of wood and just just almost the sound that 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 yeah, you get when you pick it up, yeah. you can just hear how that piece amplifies that mm -hmm. just the, the brushing of your fingertips as you as you hold this piece of wood. So I will I will pick out the tops that are the stiffest and lightest tops mm -hmm. that I can find out of. Out of those piles, and those will be the ones that will, that I know confidently that we can turn into wonderful guitars. So it really starts with the selection of the timbers. Mm. Mm. And what I admire about you guys is your complete refusal to compromise when it comes to the quality of the woods you use. Yeah. Um, we've got some examples here. Um, is that Koa or on the top? I see. That is Koa, indeed. Beautiful. Yeah, this is what's known as um, high elevation Koa. It's mm. amazing stuff. Um, and it was a real treasure hunt to actually find. A merchant who's actually become a friend. We've never met him, but yeah. he's, he's a dear friend, and he he's actually he, he dips into his personal stash that he doesn't even advertise or sell. Oh, to that's people. the sort of yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the kind of mm -hmm. that's the kind of relationships that that we have to foster and establish mm -hmm. with with our wood merchants. And anyway, this this is as I said, what's known as um, high elevation power. So it's grown really high up on the I think northeastern slopes of Mauna Kea, which is the highest peak in, mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what's 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 special about the the high elevation stuff, and it's the same that is true obviously for the German spruce that, that grows at also very high altitudes. It grows slower, mm -hmm. so it's also going to be stiffer. And um, yeah, this is also by growing higher up, it's, it's sort of less susceptible to you know bug rot and all the other things. Absolutely, and um, it's had to struggle as well. Yeah. It's, it's like the difference yeah. between wild salmon and farmed salmon. Mm. You know, it's, Definitely. It, it's got some yeah. muscle to it. Mm. Yeah, so this is this is fantastically stiff. Wow, it's very light, and it's it's got a wonderful. Oh wow. That's definitely not that's, damp that, No, that's not no. what I'm used to hearing in yeah. mm. So this is, this is <laughs> luckily, um, all the Koa guitars we've built have actually been from one tree right. that this merchant has, um, and he's confirmed that, and we can see, mm -hmm. simply by looking at the pieces, you can see they're all sister sets. Wow. And it's been, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. And in fact, Matthew, I think this one has my name on it. Let me take that, and yeah. then uh, we've got some, what looks like African black ones. Right? Yeah. yeah, talk exactly. about that. This is probably our favorite wood in the whole world. You know, it's been argued that this is um, just as good, if not superior, to Brazilian, old-growth Brazilian rosewood. Mm. And, I mean, we would, we would vouch for that, I think. Mm. It kind of gives you everything that you could want, you know, in terms of spectrum, from, from the lowest lows right through everything to the highest highs. And so it's wonderful because as an artist, they, you, you then have the entire palette at your disposal. Mm, so when you're building, you can really, you know that you, you have all of these color, colors that you can work with. And whatever it is that you want to get out of this particular build, you know you'll be able to do it. There's no, there's no real sort of limitation on, on, this, on this palette that, that it gives you. Um, it's incredibly hard and incredibly dense. You know, it really wears through tools that are probably the, the fastest rate out of any of the woods that we work with. Um, and because of that, it's also incredibly heavy. Mm. So it has this incredible sustain. Um, 
You know, it's not it's not the sort of quick attack and response of mahogany by any means, but it has this sustain that just goes on forever mm. and gives you all of these rich colors. So there's something there's something very special about this, and, and you know, to us, this is a. It's also African. It's obviously African black. Well, and of course, yeah, yeah exactly. It's it comes from the, the same yeah. continent. So this this is a set of um, wenge that we have here. Mm -hmm. And this has also been likened to the really good old Brazilian. Yes, uh, Irvin Samoji is particularly oh, fond of Irvin Samoji, yes. Mm -hmm. And actually we use this for the um, internal sides of our double-sided construction. Really? Um, wow. for, for various reasons. We used to use East Indian rosewood, mm -hmm. but since the whole site is debacle, <laughs> we've pulled the plug on that, as, you know, where possible to not include um, any rosewood, if it's a mm -hmm. non-rosewood back and sides guitar. So the thing about the Wenge is it's obviously local. We can we can source it and buy it locally, and we cut it ourselves. It's also really easy to bend, you know. So we can do our really mm. tight cutaways with it's a it's yeah. a breeze. Oh, fantastic! And it's it is a phenomenal tone wood. You know, it's it's just got that kind of glassy sort of ring to it, with with also a lot of sustain. And yeah, it's also also become a favourite. Mm. Built, a, built a couple of guitars out of it now and uh, looking forward to the next one. Our first instrument that we built with uh, Zero Coty was a C1 mm. full signature with an Addy top. So it's our smaller it body, well. smaller body, sort of grand concert size. It's got a sort of quality that, I don't know, it's difficult to put your finger on, but you've, you've had more experience with well, with, with guitars built from this. Yes, so, um, yeah, what do you think? it's one of my favorite woods. I, I think it's uh, visually very beautiful, but sonically, I think it shares a lot of the same characteristics that, um, although it doesn't look that way, uh, that good maple does. Mm. You know, you've got that same um, almost uh, cello bass, especially when you uh, when you add an Adirondack top or a German spruce top, something like that, something really live and mm. responsive. Mm. Moon spruce too, you'll get great results from that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's got a dryness to it. The, the initial note itself is very pure. The attack mm. is, uh, is smooth. And um, it really is a fantastic mm. wood. Am I right in thinking that the, there isn't an upper transverse brace exactly? What you have is uh, a brace that runs from the start of the cutaway through that, to the... That is how we initially did it on that, this that, one. Yeah. Right. Exactly. How we do it currently is we actually we angle the the upper transverse brace through. You've oh, got a very okay. narrow gap to, to, the, to kind of work it through there. The yeah. Yeah. So it runs diagonally across like that, all the way to the other side. So it locks in to the solid lining on that side and that side. Wow. Yeah. And what that actually does, if you also think about it, because you know, even though the, the pattern that we're currently working with is it's actually symmetrical, hmm. um, as opposed to this, which is, you, know, you can really see there's a sort of distinct difference between what's very tight over here this sort of more obviously catering to your trebles mm. and then there's, there's more openness here on the base on the base side we actually used to thin out the top a bit more on the base side also right just to get that to be a bit more active <clears throat> but um, so also kind of already angling that that upper transverse effectively opens up a bit more of the soundboard mm. up here which you I'm know, it's, it's hard to say you know how much difference that makes, but it's you know when as as a luthier, when it's constantly thinking about you know these sort of things don't let you mm. sleep. Mm. You're constantly thinking, you know, what if we do that? What if we do this? It's, mm. But it's also it's about making very small incremental changes mm. and then tracking the progress. Yeah. You, know, you can't be too yeah. experimental with every build. Yeah, yeah. like literally yeah. every point five of a millimeter makes a difference. Yeah, you know, when you're dealing with with a recipe where you're constantly, constantly trying to refine things. You have to do it in a very careful, systematic way and constantly keep track of what it was that you changed last time and what the possible influences were that that had and then how to refine that yet again. So it's, mm. it's literally been a process of incremental, um, incre like 0.5 of a millimeter here, 0.5 of a millimeter there, maybe a millimeter here, maybe. 1.5 millimeters there, like that's yeah. daring. <laughs> that's pretty extreme. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when, you, when you're talking about the bridge, for instance, which in this instance is like a very primitive version of what it's become, you know, we've been dealing in increments of 0.2 of a millimeter quite mm. regularly 
just you know moving things slightly to just give you a little bit more of a break angle, but a little bit more room for um, adjusting intonation. You right. know, when you're talking about the saddle, so you know here we were still using I think it's a three point five or was it a three point millimeter? Yeah, it's three quite, three, a, three quite millimeter a skinny saddle, saddle for you yeah, guys, exactly. isn't it? And then we we've moved to using a six millimeter saddle, which means that you've got to kind of like carefully adjust things, and especially when you've got half your half your bridge is kind of missing because of these holes. And you've created a design where you're creating the illusion of symmetry. It's not actually a symmetrical thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's yeah. got the illusion of symmetry. So every increment makes a difference because it can throw your eye, but it can also make the thing become less functional. It can weaken it. <laughs> it's quite quite a dangerous thing to mess with. <laughs> so yeah, for us, it's really a, sort of a balancing act between science and art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's this this intuition that, that, that is there. But there's also, you know, we'll weigh every top once it's finished before we glue it on. Really? We'll actually write down that weight of each different guitar that we built. And we start tracking sort of, um, you know, all the C2s will sort of fall into a zone mm -hmm. within, within kind of grams of each other. And then obviously the C3s will be a little bit heavier and then all of that. So, and, then, and then once it's boxed up, we'll actually also record the resonant pitch of that sound box. Wow. Obviously, a smaller box is going to, going to have a slightly higher pitch. Mm -hmm. And they, I would say they're about semitones apart, actually, from our mm -hmm. C1 mm -hmm. to C2 to C3. And then obviously the C4 should mm -hmm. probably fall into line also. Do you find mm -hmm. that the, uh, the pitch of the box rises once you put the bridge on? It actually drops. Really? Considerably. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. But then it does something interesting once you add a sound port yes. as well. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> that, that actually pushes the pitch up again. Does yeah. it? Yeah. So now we're going to tell you a very interesting story about our first experience with sound ports. Tell me. Now this is again back to our dear friend Ziggy. Comes mm. back to this guitar as well. Yes. Right. And that, that is the guitar in question. I know this looks like a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's very gory. But it was a, it was a very, very informative yeah. learning experience. So, so what happened with... Um, you know, we had, had this, um, this, this dear friend of our Ziggy, who was building his guitar. And every step of the way, he would, he would be researching, like, okay, what do they do? Um, what's possible with regards to, you know, sides? So he researched that, and then he got to the, the neck. And anyway, so we came to this thing of sound ports. And he did a whole lot of research and, and sent us links. And, and we sort of looked at this, all of this, and, you know, there were... There were some people swearing by them. There were other people swearing at them, and it was like, <laughs> it was like, well, look, we, we're not gonna, we're actually not gonna know um, the truth of this, because obviously every every builder has their own sort of recipe of how they also build their guitars, and mm. it may may work for some and may not work for others. Absolutely. So what we what we decided to do, which probably at the, at the time would have been considered another of our sort of harebrained schemes, was to was to cut a sound port in a in the C2 signature, in fact this one, which was mm. the very first guitar that Michael played of ours. And we actually did it just before coming to London also, <laughs> just to add even more sort of risk into the equation. <laughs> we really are insane, <laughs> but it seems to have paid off. So, so, having, having, so this was actually a, this was a finished guitar, it was a full signature finished right. guitar, a showcase guitar that we, that we had around for about three years before we, we brought it to London. And we thought, okay, we know the sound of this guitar, we love it. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really find out what, what difference a sound port will make to, is to retrofit one. Get in there on with a the toffee guitar. hammer. <laughs> oh my god. So we, god, we cut the hole. We got and, our drill. <laughs> and I still remember when, when the three of us it was it was sort of late one night when, when and Ziggy was of course part of us. Mm. We sort of stood around and we and we um, we kind of obviously took turns playing this thing and then listening. And there was an inherent inherent difference. Mm. It actually improved the tone. Mm. What it, what it yeah, seemed to do was like, it seemed to tidy up the bases. Right. So there was, there was, from the start, this guitar had an amazing sound. You know, everybody that came across it would kind of go, whoa. It was a monster. What is yeah. that? Oh, I remember that very and, well. And right? Yeah, and we did the same thing as well. We're like, wow. So, so cutting a sound hole, sound, sound port in, in such a guitar was obviously a very big deal. And we wouldn't have done it. Um, lightly, it wasn't. I mean, it was a hairbrain scheme, but it was a calculated hairbrain <laughs> scheme. <laughs> Those were the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what what we noticed was that um, it didn't lose any of its power. Mm. It didn't lose any of its um, scope in terms of tonal palette. Mm -hmm. Didn't lose any sustain. Didn't lose any clarity. It didn't lose any separation. 
It didn't mess with the guitar in a bad way at all. What it did was it tidied up something which we had hardly even been aware of in the sort of harmonics which are around the bass end of the guitar. Mm -hmm. The, the, maybe maybe the, the the secondary harmonics or something where there had maybe been some kind of an interference pattern, right? Which wasn't perfectly happy, and once once we cut that sound board in there, it tidied that right up, and it's kind of like that last half of a percent, which suddenly makes the thing. It yeah. was like you know we suddenly all just went wow. That that's makes really sense. it now. Yeah, it's like we kind of tamed mm. tamed the wild beast. You know, it was really. Mm. It was a much happier guitar mm, mm. once once it had that sound port. And also, uh, you know, um, besides all of that, you know, it's, it's almost like if you think of it as having two speakers instead of one. Right. You yeah. Know, so you get a bit more yeah. of a sort of three dimensional picture mm -hmm. of the actual sound of this instrument for the for the player, but not only for the player for um, for the people standing around. And we mm, we, we mm. all experience that. Yeah, because suddenly the sound yeah. is traveling not only in one direction. Yeah, absolutely. It's traveling it's in diffuse, two directions. but it's still yeah. projecting, and, and it's refracting yeah. off things in yeah. a different way as well. So. And then also just to um, just to confirm that, because obviously there's this um, this whole thing of psychoacoustics, and, and you, know, you <laughs> yeah. confuse yourself or convince it's yourself. Of, yeah, <laughs> even even sometimes depending on how much you paid for a guitar, you'll convince oh, yourself absolutely. that oh, well, yeah. this is yeah. absolutely amazing. It must yeah. be. <laughs> so what what you can a simple experiment then after just to con just to reconfirm all of this was to just take some masking tape mm. and actually just mask o mask over the the sound port and then and then and then play it again and then pull the tape off and there so we did go. that multiple times and and from then on basically every guitar we built had a sound port unless mm. the customer um, requested not to have yeah, it. yeah which we've also done in, in one and you know it could be it could be that there's still room for debate because it might just be that. On a Cassini guitar, a sound board really works mm. because of the way that our recipe is put together and the way mm. that we build, and it just works for yeah. us. Yeah. So it's it's not to say that you know necessarily sound ports are going to be the next step in evolution for guitar building as a whole. Well, there's a lot of debate about every aspect of the yeah. instrument, isn't yeah. there? Um, as far as sound ports are concerned, I remember talking to Grit Laskin at the Holy Grail show a couple of years back, and he was one of the first guys uh, to put a sound port in an acoustic guitar mm. and he explained it by saying the wave of an E string of the, the low E mm. is actually about 13 feet long so it makes sense to drill a hole and actually let it out because mm. otherwise you know the, the inner architecture of a guitar it's kind of bouncing around yes yeah, it's, just bouncing around. Just, yeah. it's almost like um, yeah. what the Incas used to do trep panning they just drill a little hole in your skull yes. <laughs> and yeah. let, it, let it out yeah. that way <laughs> Well, well, that's actually the thing, because that, that's the other point. It's, it's almost like um, the guitar is allowed to breathe a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. There are certain designs um, where I have played a guitar with a soundboard and it hasn't necessarily worked. There are others. Um, your work, that of Michael Bashkin, and the Greenfield guitars I've played with soundboards have all been sublime. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that's due to the soundboard necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I've got no uh, no mm. actual issue with them, mm. except for the fact that if you're using the guitar in a live context, yes. you yeah. may yeah, yeah, experience yeah. feedback that's, and that's exactly yeah, that's like something that. we are aware of. No, that's that's definitely I think it's mm. a consideration for strictly acoustic guitars only. Mm. I mean, what, what we're dealing with here is the sound of air coming out of the box, mm -hmm. and not anything to do with the pickup or a PA system, or any relationship between those things. Mm. That's obviously going to be complicated when it comes to they encouraging make... vibration. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. They, they also make for um, great recording guitars, because you've mm, suddenly yeah. got two axes mm. that you can work on laterally across the body yeah. of the instrument, yeah. and then up mm. and down, mm. unless you've got a particularly noisy player um, who's, you know, huffing and sniffing. With a, with a mic in front of their face. If you can give them a snorkel or something, you'll get them to <laughs> yeah. breathe over their shoulder. Um, it can be very effective. But I often use this analogy um, of a chef, or mm. anybody for that matter, cooking a meal. You, know, you, can give, you can give two people the exact same ingredients and the exact same in instructions um, on how to make this meal. And there, there'll be two very different meals at the end of that. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it's very easy to completely cock it up and, and build a terrible guitar with the most amazing timbers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Guys, you live in one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Um, how important mm. is the landscape and nature to you uh, from an inspiration point of view? Very important. 
Um, it's true what you say. I mean, I've, I've been to various different parts of the world, and every time I come back, I get off the plane and I go, wow, <laughs> this is really, really beautiful. And it's, you know, it is it's an endless source of inspiration. And it, I, I can never get bored of it. I can go up that mountain any time, and I can look across that bay and drink in that view. And, you know, it just, it just fills, it fills my inner wellspring of inspiration right up to the brim. Um, well, should we yeah. do that? We should do that. Come on, then. <laughs> Come on. Let's go. So, where exactly are we going today, guys? Because um, okay. we have a bit of a, a bit of a road trip planned, don't we? What, what's the plan? We have a plan. Do we have a, well, There's always yeah, a plan. The plan is to take you off to see some penguins. Yes. In Simonstown. Wonderful. Um, and thereafter to head down to Cape Point, where you can witness the division between the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. Beautiful. From a very nice lighthouse mm -hmm. up on the top of the... Yeah, I've, I've heard that you can cliff. actually see it um, on, on some days. You can, you can see the, 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 different, yeah. the oceans have two different colours, don't they? It's, um, it's kind of like... A, I think they're two different currents. Right. But I don't know if it's the actual geographic location. <laughs> Specifically, it, yeah, it's not a cartographical the line, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but it is. It does. It does have a whole lot of um, mythology around it because mm. you know people people look at them and go, "Wow, look! One side's this color, and the other side's that color." So it is. It is sort of famous for that. Now, in all the years I've known you, um, I haven't actually asked this question, but I have been kind of curious. Uh, where does the name Kasimi come from? Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's actually an Arabic word. Really? Yeah, it's a it's an astrological term. Right. And it's, um, to my understanding, what it, you know, if I were to try and translate it directly, which I couldn't, but uh, so I'm told that's what it means, is that when the planets are lined up with the center of the sun, mm. so it's called Kasimi is is called in the heart of the sun, and right. what it what it basically is is like the ultimate conjunction for creativity. Wow. So okay. it seemed like an apt <laughs> an apt name. It makes sense. Yeah. So does your logo reflect that as well? It does indeed. So the logo is basically you could you could interpret it as a symbol which is interpretable in many ways. Mm -hmm. But the, the sort of core of it would be um, that it's something of a seed and right. something of a raindrop in the center. So is wow, that kind of okay water droplet in the center which then is also a germinating seed so it's it's a kind of a seed which is sprouting out and then creating a tree which helps to populate the atmosphere with oxygen beautiful and also rain which mm. then forms droplets and comes back down to water seeds which so it's a whole process. ecosystem. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a symbol of life. It's, um, right. And of course the trees, obviously, that we use to build the guitars from also. Exactly. It's also appropriate mm. on that level. And it's also, it's also you, could, you could look at it like um, the outpouring of, of life from the heart of the sun. So right. water and the sun are the two kind of essential ingredients mm -hmm. for life on Earth. <laughs> what I love about uh, the way that you guys work is it's, it's very much a two-man team with with distinct uh, roles. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you do obviously overlap, but um, Matthew, you started off as a uh, artist and jeweler, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. I've worked some. I've worked some some interesting jobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I was a I was a full-time musician for many years, and then um, I've always been into art and design in mm -hmm. one, one sense or another. I studied it at school and since I was a little kid I've been drawing things. But um, I sort of went into that as more of a professional career um, when I went into jewellery design and manufacture. Right. Uh, when was this? Terrible with dates. <laughs> Probably like 2000. Must have been about 2005 or 2005, something like that. 2005, 2000, yeah. yeah, something like that. And um, so I worked with a friend of mine great time producing very interesting jewelry. Mm. So when I um, came to Mangard Guitars, I sort of the, the skills that I'd learned there translated very well immediately into inlay. Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so, that's, uh, you've been doing some spectacular stuff there with uh, with some very interesting materials as well. You know. Well, I'll, I'll use anything I can get my hands on that'll work, really, if it's if it's beautiful and if it's a quality material. Mm-hmm. But um, most of most of the time, I'm using a combination of um, things like one of my favourite things is a Hawaiian black lip pearl. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, lots of brass and copper because I, I love the contrast that you can create with that um, and, and certain dyed woods as well so certain um, reds and greens um, which are Japanese stains in maple and and then also just different woods so I'll, I'll combine things like koa and pernambuco if I've got a bit a bit of an off, off cut lying around um, whatever I can find really it's like you know the materials materials are really the color palette for for whatever inlay project I'm looking at. Yeah. Uh, we have a sort of standing joke where we refer to ourselves as, so he's the Minister of Aesthetics <laughs> and I'm the Minister of Tone. And we actually <laughs> kind of joked about it and said, hey, the next time we print business cards, we may just put that on just for a laugh. Yeah, oh, you have to. <laughs> Please, but it's I'll really, pay for um, them myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really like... Um, yeah, in many ways it's the ultimate partnership, you know, besides being best yeah. friends from, from a very early age, sort of uh, seven and five or, or eight and five um, is the age difference, so Matthew's about three years older than myself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so besides the, the, the best friend aspect, there's really this sort of perfect balance between form and function yeah. that coexists between us. And um, yeah, that, that, that is Kasimi Guitars. Mm. Where it all really started for for me, um, I I was very lucky in having gone to a Waldorf school, which is sort of an alternative form of education. Oh, like a Montessori or something. It's like that. it's yeah. it has similar there's there's certain overlaps, mm-hmm. but it's yeah. in many ways also quite different. In, in the UK, you'd probably call it a Steiner school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So anyway, um, before the final year, which which um, we call them a trick which is before you enter university. Um, at, specifically at the Waldorf schools, there's a there's actually an extra year oh, really? before that year. So you finish your, your normal school curriculum and then there's an extra year and then you do your matric. So in that extra, in that extra year, every student um, focuses on a project. Hmm. Uh, it can be anything from, you know, writing a book, learning ballroom dancing, you know, pretty much whatever they want, you know, photography, film. Wow. Making yeah. a movie. And it's a six month. It's a six month yeah. project, so it's compre- It's very comprehensive. Yeah. Mm. You're expected to go into it in great depth and yeah. really sort of explore that. So what I did was I um, I got my hands on a on a book, um, a guitar building book, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't put this thing down. <laughs> it was actually from a friend of mine um, at school. His dad was a bit of a guitar collector, and he had this book. So I took this thing home and I, I decided that what I had to do for my project was build a traditional flamenco guitar. How old the, are you then? With the wooden pegs and everything. I was about 18. Wow. So I managed to get hold of my external mentor who was connected to the school at the time, Mark Maingard. Hmm. And he enabled me to do this in his workshop as my external mentor. So I, I built this guitar wow. for this project. And then, I, then there's a big presentation, and I think I even played, I managed to play something, um, having completed this guitar. And then after that, to sort of round off the process, I went with my folks to his house out in Scarborough, which is a little fishing, uh, sorry, a little con- uh, conservation village on the Atlantic coast. And so we went for tea there to round off the process, and he basically put this sort of apprenticeship job off on the table. <laughs> And I just snapped it up right there and then. Wow. And luckily my parents supported me in that. So I actually didn't finish my matric. I went straight, I started young. Mm-hmm. 19 years old, I, I became an apprentice for Mark Mangold. So um, you, were, you were doomed to succeed? I was. <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I also built a guitar for my, I also went to the water school. Mm. And I built a, an electric guitar. We have a picture of it, don't we? Yeah, we'll never show that in public. Oh, go on. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, um, 
I was obsessed with with rock music and, and heavy metal and um, oh, a whole variety of different kinds of music. But I was determined that I had to have an electric guitar. And um, we didn't have a whole lot of money, so to go off and buy an electric guitar was not really a, an option. Um, so when the Glasswell project came along, I, I just sort of thought, well, this is my opportunity. I'm going to make one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you did. I'm going to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a little peek down at what's called Smitswinkel by. There's no road access, so it's only so the cars have to park on the road and. They have little houses down there, it's mostly little holiday wow. sort of cottages. They walk down. And I'm seeing signs all over the place, lads, with just baboons! <laughs> Exclamation mark. Uh, are they an issue around here? Well, if you live around here, you'll soon feel that those signs don't quite do the issue justice. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's, <that> bad, it? <laughs> it's pretty intense. It can be. But most of the time it's actually, they're very relaxed and they just move around in small groups and, you know, chew on the old bulb or something. Well, look, the idea of chilled out baboon activity isn't that much of an issue, but I can imagine if you get riled up then... Yeah, if you leave, like, if you leave food around, mm. if they can see that you've got food, if they can see that you've got a bag, and they've, they've even figured out now how to open car doors and things. Yeah, one of, one of the biggest yeah, problems is learning. actually tourists that, <laughs> that feed them. Oh, well, right, yeah, I can and imagine. And so now they obviously associate humans with food. So, you know, they'll, they'll break into cars, they'll break into houses where they can and basically raid the pantry. Right, well, they're, they're going to be disappointed this time, aren't they? I don't think there are any around here right no, now. No, but we should see some at Cape Point. Yeah, probably. fantastic. Yeah, well, we can drive again, we don't have to look out. Yeah. This is the little Smith's Winkle Bar down here. Yeah, so one of the things we used to really enjoy being out here, besides all the nature and beautiful sights, was the absolute peace and quiet, mm. especially at night, when everything was just dead still. And it was just ideal conditions for, you know, voicing the soundboards. So when you guys started out as Kasimi Guitars properly, what external influences did you, did you have access to? Well... I suppose if you were to go right back to that original guitar that we discussed earlier, um, I wasn't I wasn't coming from a background of of modern luthery. Right. I was coming from a background of a guy who had been a musician for a long time and was interested in art and design and had done a whole lot of jewelry design and manufacture. So that was my approach to fantasizing about an acoustic guitar and. Um, I wasn't aware of any of our current contemporaries at that mm -hmm. stage. And so the drawings that I did were really, you know, they, they came out of my own head. They developed yeah. in isolation. And I think that's one of the interesting things about Kasimi is that Kasimi did develop very much in isolation. You know, we're down here at the foot of Africa. Mm. We're not in the middle of where most of the modern Luthery world is happening. Um, but if you were to look at it, you know, if I, if I look at it now, in hindsight, I can see parallels, which are quite interesting, because I think parallels which develop in isolation are even more interesting mm. than, than parallels which, you know, are clear influences. So in independent evolution. Yeah. Um, you know, I would, I would say that having discovered Michi Matsuda years down the line, um, as I became... You know, as I, as, I, as I started to work at Mangard Guitars, I obviously started to find out about these things. Um, Miji Matsuda is a source of inspiration to me personally, although he wasn't, I wasn't aware of his work when I was designing the sort of prototype, mm. prototype Kasimi guitar. Um, I find what he does is, as a designer, from a design point of view, is absolutely fascinating. And in addition to that, I've always been fascinated by Japanese, um, the Japanese aesthetic, which I think Michi has somehow managed to take up and put into a modern form in a new way in into Luthery. And it's, to me, that's just one of the most awesome and wonderful things to look at. I've long been fascinated by Japanese culture and the Japanese way of doing things. And there is this kind of beauty in simplicity. Yeah. Um, I think the French say less is more. Mm. 
although they say it in French, I believe. You do. What I've noticed about your workshop is, is there is this sort of minimalism to it, isn't there? You've got your, your chisels racked up, you've got your pencils all in the, all in the right place, you know? It, it, it seems very ordered. <laughs> Look, I think, for, you know, speaking for myself, I like to keep, I've always been like that, I've always been slightly um, fastidious mm. when it comes to keeping anything from pencil crayons to tools. I just, I like to know where things are because per perhaps it's because I'm slightly chaotic <laughs> mentally. And, and if I, if I can't find things, then I sort of, you know, I don't have a sort of mental system to keep track of things. So <laughs> I keep things very ordered so that I can work in a very ordered way. Uh, you know, that helps to keep the work clean. You know, our first workshop was actually pretty small also. Mm -hmm. mm. And obviously in, in smaller spaces, one has, has to be much more disciplined and ordered. Everything has to have a place, and a place for everything. <laughs> Especially if you're in a shed. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and uh, also the tools, they, they, you know, when you've been doing this for so long, I think I've been doing this now for about 19 years, mm. you know, these, these tools become your tried and trusted friends and their home is really in your hands mm. if they're not on the rack Absolutely. and everyone performs a specific function and they do it really well so you know we have we kind of have the bare minimum you know only what we need what is essential and what works and what does the job well we often have this joke you know we sort of look at um, these beautiful workshops the likes of you know Michael Greenfield and Jason Costell, yeah. and we sort of see how you know he has all these rooms. You know, he has a chisel room <laughs> and a sharpening room and a sanding room <laughs> and a Michael Watts room. <laughs> yeah, and we we really hope he has a, a Cassini room too because uh, we'd love to go and visit him. And hopefully, when Michael's there, also. Get I'm to sure know. we can arrange something. Also, I was I was quite early on my sort of apprenticeship days I became aware of Irvin Samaji right. and really you could see that he was he was he was considered kind of the godfather of modern guitar making mm. and he really is that um, having had the privilege of actually reading through his book right. The Responsive Guitar and also reading his blog posts <laughs> you know, he's, he's somebody right. that yeah, yeah, he? yeah he does he does it's you just yeah, you get you get lost in this stuff, and what I really appreciate, you, you can really see that he's a he's an exceptional teacher, mm. because what he does is he'll drop these these little pearls of wisdom, that kind of that force you to think, and force you to also make it your own. Mm. So he doesn't give you the answers, and I think that's what a good teacher does. So he's also he's somebody that we have immense respect for. But I think there's a lot of guys who just see. It's almost like I think people people sometimes see a way out of the rat race. Yeah. You know, they go, oh wow. Look, they're building guitars and they and it's great and they're having a wonderful life and you know they're selling them overseas and they're getting great prices and maybe I can do that too and then mm -hmm. I can get out of my terrible job that I hate. Mm -hmm. um, uh. And and they don't realise that, that, that that's true, possibly true. But the time spans involved are like 10 to 20 years. Exactly. It's not going to happen next month. Um, one thing that I've seen uh, recently is the way that uh, Tom Sands and Daisy have been working together. Yeah, Hi guys. I've been watching some of that. How yeah. are you doing? Um, great yeah. work. <laughs> it is. It is great work because you know Tom obviously he apprenticed with Irvin. Yes. Um, before apprenticing with Irvin, you know, just to get through the door, you have to have exceptional fine motor skills, and he obviously does. I mean, his, his work is, is extraordinarily clean and, and beautifully yeah. executed. And so in working with Daisy, who's just at the start of uh, a career in Lou 3, you get to watch um, the process of becoming. What we're seeing here is, is a, a really open view into the learning process itself. You know, I, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I, I look forward to, to Tom's uh, Monday morning uh, update. Week by week. By week <laughs> yeah, the week that was or something. What day is it today? Monday. <laughs> Welcome back to the week this week. But it's interesting, I mean, there's an old, age-old practice of the apprenticeship. 
Yes. That's the only way to do this. Absolutely. It's the only way to do anything where you're going to seriously apply yourself with your hands, your eyes, your heart, mm -hmm. and your head all at the same time. And the way um, that Irvin does it, it is, um, it's a legitimate Renaissance style apprenticeship. It's like the uh, Titian or Tintoretto, uh, Tintoretto workshops. Mm. You know, you've got the, uh, the apprentices doing, they've got the hand skills to do most of the, in inverted commas, grunt work. And then the master steps down from on high and either, uh, uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, puts down the master stroke or voices that top. Mm -hmm. And then, whew, there you go, it's been, it's, it is officially a Titian or a Tintoretto or, uh, or a Samoji guitar. And that little building up there was the uh, first Kasima guitar workshop. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a beautiful place to work, mate, but the wow. commute is hell. We, we also have a lot of humidity problems. That's, right? that's probably yeah. true, actually. It's very yeah. high humidity. So that was Cape Point. That was. A very what? beautiful part of Stillis. Still is. Still is. Yeah. It's still is. We're yeah. still in, in the nature reserve. Right. And what, what sort of uh, wildlife can I expect to see in this nature You'll reserve? You'll get some buck. Right. Okay, some, uh, some baboons. Some, some baboons. baboons. I'm still waiting. I've some seen ostriches. Really? Some tortoises. Um, Maybe a there are some zebras might. even in here, I think. Hey? Yeah, there are zebras. Yeah. Um, I don't know about leopards. But there would have been leopards here. There, sh there should really? be a leopard. Back, back in the day. Died, died, off, yeah. died off by now. I think the reserve itself might be a little bit too small. They need a, a big territory they need a huge to, range. To, to function. But effect. apparently, there is still one or two, are oh, still one or two leopards uh, roaming around the Table Mountain mm. National Park mm. area. They get spotted every once in a while. Lesser spotted. <laughs> <laughs> the lesser spotted. No pun intended. <laughs> well, I, well, you see, the sad yes. thing is, mate, they can't change that. <laughs> Right, that's my <laughs> wildlife commentary for the afternoon. <laughs> There's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> so here we are, eating ostrich wraps. Mm. And we're about to stumble upon a group of baboons. Oh wow, there they are. <laughs> Hello ladies. <laughs> There's the alpha male on the side there. You can see him roaming through the Oh wow. The grasses. I can't open the window, can I? No, you can, you can. Just be ready to shut it. Mm. Mm. Baboon time and has did I see a female with a a little one as well? Wow, mm -hmm. look at him. Oh, up we go. Now that guy, believe it or not, has the strength of seven men. You know what, I think I can believe that. If but he stands up, he's probably going to come up to about your shoulder. That's really reassuring, actually, mate. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting. Um, apparently the cape, you know what a biome is? Have you heard of a biome? I don't know, I don't I remember know. hearing the word first in high school biology. The biome is like a plant kingdom. So right. it's an area, a geographical area, where certain kinds of plants occur. So mm. the Amazon rainforest is its own biome. Okay. And um, Europe is its own biome. It has its own particular kinds of species. And the Cape, um, I'm not quite sure where it begins and ends, but it's very small. It's the smallest biome in the world. Really? And it's basically around the kind of Western Cape area. But it's got the most species in it. But it's got more species than, than any, any other biome. Yeah. So it's got more species than the Amazon rainforest in an area which is a fraction of the size. Really? It's very interesting. True and you story. Get, yeah, true story. And you get um, you get these fascinating plants which, you know, you'll find, you'll come across a particular kind of flower that only grows on one particular slope of one particular mountain. Wow. It's unbelievable when you think like, millions of years of evolution have led to that one particular flower being only there and it hasn't spread across the valley to the other side. So we're now coming up the drive 
right. of what is now the defunct Cassini Guitar Workshop. Right. From we were here for about three years, I think, Matt. Eh? Yeah. 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 And Derek Gripper used to used to actually live in that little cottage over there. Oh, really? Until until his dog ate a baboon, <laughs> and he had to leave. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> It's a very impressive feat for a dog. <laughs> yeah, what kind of dog was it? Like a, a Jack Russell Terrier? It's like a German Shepherd or something. It's a Swiss Shepherd. Wow. Yeah. It's a black beast. And it ate an entire baboon. So apparently he came home one day and he found his dog lying contentedly by the fire with bits of baboon strewn around the <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> and this is, um, yeah, this whole landscape is rather mythical. This felt. I could never decide whether it was, you know, mythical or Blair Witch Project. <laughs> but I, I settled on mythical because the name of the farm is Witchwood's Farm. Oh right, okay. And if I'd settled on the Blair Witch Project, then I would never oh. have come back to work. <laughs> that would have been a bit too much, wouldn't it? <laughs> the joke also was, which woods would you like on your guitar, sir? So, <laughs> when a new customer arrived. <laughs> oh, there's a new fence. I wasn't there before. Look at that, and there's a car. Good God, another Ooh. car. Hello? Hello. Oh, look at the gate. Oh. No ways. Jeez. Wow. This is high security now. This used to be. I wonder if Jenny and them are still here I even. I wonder. No ways. I could never see Jenny doing this. Look, look at the house. What? It looks completely different. It's double story and there's a... What? What, what is they sold? Here? It must have been sold. No ways. It's a bit of a shock moment here, Michael. No, so it's I understand. Absolutely not what we expected. This used to be a rusty old barbed wire fence, mm -hmm. which is sort of, was about waist height. And this gate was a <coughs> the rickety old thing that was padlocked with padlocked a big chain. Shot. And then there was a sort of a rusty barbed wire fence carried on that. Yeah. If we go straight, we can we can have a look at the old workshop. Was just behind these bush, these uh, trees in front of us, just through the gate. There it is. Oh. Hang on, that's wow, it's definitely that's had some work. Look, that was actually the spray booth, the little black shed to the to the right of the. Oh, green hang on, let me turn the window. Yeah, this this is an Audi TT. Right. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> and is our chimney still smoking? We installed that fireplace. Yeah. So we had a that, fireplace in our workshop. That was the first Cassini Guitars that was workshop. The first Cassini Guitars workshop. <laughs> and now there's some hippie who's going to find themselves on YouTube. <laughs> Well, we hope that you've enjoyed this behind-the-scenes look at Cassini guitars and the beautiful country in which these spectacular instruments are made. All that really remains to be said is uh, thank you to Matthias and Matthew. Thank you to you for watching, and until next time, stay tuned. Bye.